As China and Mexico celebrate 50 years of diplomatic ties, we take a look at Chinese relations with Latin America and how it's changing the geopolitical landscape in the region. Hello, I'm Arnold Neider, and this is The Heat. Mexico and China established diplomatic relations in 1972. A ceremony was held Monday in Mexico City to celebrate. It was one of the first Latin American countries to have diplomatic ties with China, and it's considered by Beijing a Lao Peño, or old friend. Another country that will celebrate its 50th anniversary of diplomatic relations with China this year is Argentina. Argentinian President Alberto Fernandez was in Beijing to attend the Winter Olympics and signed an agreement to join the Belt and Road Initiative, China's ambitious plan to develop international infrastructure to advance global trade. And Chinese President Xi also met with Ecuadorian President Guillermo Lasso. The two countries are negotiating a free trade agreement. I am very optimistic about what we can achieve in terms of debt renegotiation. And we agreed that by October, we will be ready to sign the free trade agreement. We have a lot to talk about. Let's bring in our panelists. Tony Payan is the director of the Center for Mexico at Rice University. He joins us from Houston. From Sao Paulo State in Brazil, Gilson Schwartz is a professor of economics at the University of Sao Paulo. Here in Washington, D.C., Michael Schifter is the president of the Inter-American Dialogue Think Tank. And Ina Tangan is a political and economic affairs commentator. He joins us from Beijing. Welcome to all of you. Tony Pai, let me start with you. Welcome to the show. Uh, Mexico and China, as I just mentioned, celebrating 50 years of diplomatic ties. Um, their economic ties have grown steadily over the years. If we look at some figures here, in 2000, China represented about 1% of Mexico's foreign trade. In 2019, that figure jumped to 10%. So, to what would you attribute that kind of growth, and where do you see this relationship going? I think that the interest that China has uh, on Mexico has to do particularly with gaining a foothold in North America as the relationship between the United States and China gets more and more complicated. And uh, we have seen, for example, that the Biden administration has not lifted some of the, uh, some of the restrictions on Chinese trade uh, then China has seen Mexico, which is part of the North American platform, the USMCA, is a good opportunity to have a foot inside North America. And I expect in the future that a lot of the Chinese investment in Mexico will be directed uh, clearly towards the U.S. market, because once you are in Mexico, you invest and you produce in Mexico, then you have access to this huge market called the United States. And so I think this will only accelerate in the coming years. Anna Tangan, uh, China's foreign trade and diplomatic relations extend, of course, across the globe, but uh, how important is Latin America seen by Beijing um, as a political partner, as an economic and trade partner as well? Uh, I mean, if we look at this region, it has been a region traditionally where the United States has regarded itself as being the dominant power. Well, and that's the surprising thing. I mean, uh, uh, China anticipated that the U.S. would put a lot of pushback on any kind of formal relations with uh, South America because of uh, you know, the Monroe Doctrine that uh, previously was there, although it's been repudiated. <laughs> Sometimes uh, people bring it up and say, oh, they should put it back in place. Uh, basically, the U.S. said that South America belongs to North America. Uh, now that has changed. I mean, uh, a long period of active neglect um, very contentious trade uh, issues. Uh, today, obviously, uh, it's talk about avocado, but also energy. So uh, right now, uh, it's, you know, Latin America feels kind of pushed aside, bullied by the U.S. China is obviously a country that wants to do trade, but it's unbalanced right now. Uh, the, although uh, exports were up for uh, Mexico, and imports were down, it's still very unbalanced in favor of China. Tony Pine, I just want to get to one of the points that Anna Tangan mentioned there. And we've heard this from many quarters that Latin America, Central America as well, have been largely ignored by the United States. What do you make of that? Well, it does seem to me that the United States pays attention to most of Latin America 
only when there is a particular crisis of concern to the United States, whether it be the war on drugs, the war on terror, uh, and of course, uh, the uh, then communism, the, the activities of the communist uh, system in, in Latin America. But other than that, the United States has never really been that interested in Latin America. There's always, in every single president that I can remember, an intention to pay attention to Latin America. We'll remember the famous words of George W. Bush thinking about Latin America. But as soon as something happens in the Middle East, now in East Asia and elsewhere, uh, Russia, for example, the U.S. attention is immediately turned over to those particular crises, and Latin America is quickly forgotten. Mexico, within this context, though, is exceptional because the ties between the United States and Mexico are quite deep, linguistic, cultural, historical, but also economic. And of course, there's other issues uh, not so pleasant that both countries have to deal with, such as organized crime, drug trafficking, and irregular migration. Uh, in addition to the enormous wealth produced by the, the NAFTA and now USMCA agreement. So, uh, unfortunately, I think Latin America does suffer from this sporadic attention from Washington for good intentions, but at the end of the day, the, the United States has global concerns, uh, and they certainly go well beyond uh, Latin America. I suspect, one last point, that as China increases its uh, uh, presence in Latin America uh, and the tension between the United States and uh, China grows, uh, Latin America will certainly come under the uh, close uh, inspection of uh, Washington, D.C. We'll see. Jilton Schwartz, uh, Schwartz, if we look at the nuts and bolts of this relationship between China and Latin America, literally the nuts and bolts, uh, we know that Latin America has huge infrastructure needs. In fact, the Inter-American Development Bank says the infrastructure gap in the region is estimated at $150 billion a year. China is already involved in a number of projects across the uh, continent of South America. Um, what do you make of the relationship and do you see it expanding? Well, I think that uh, Latin America, uh, sometimes it, this is overlooked, but as a matter of fact, Latin America is a kind of a magic triangle because this is a continent that connects to the North, to North America, but as well, it's very much connected to the Pacific and to the Atlantic. So from a geopolitical perspective, this is really kind of a magic triangle. Whoever establishes itself uh, very well here in this continent will have access to this kind of uh, triadic expansion, eastward, westward, and northward. So this is really important to take into account. Of course, there are huge infrastructure needs. There are also enormous resources in terms of uh, agricultural production. And of course, we have to make some room here to actually realize the importance of Brazil. Like the, the trade balance, the volume of trade and the exports from Brazil to China are literally 10 times the exports of Mexico to China. And there's also another very interesting connection that's kind of going um, not, not very much uh, perceived by analysts, and that's Africa. China's presence in Africa is very important, and Brazilian-African relations are really strategic. Let's remember that a cable has been, is in, in the works, a cable connecting Angola and Fortaleza. This is a very important broadband cable connection, submarine cables connecting Africa and Brazil with Chinese investment. So the digital Silk Road is very important, and China is approaching a region that is full, full of potential, not only for infrastructure, Chinese investments in the electric sector has been really praised and, 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 and realized by all political actors. But there's also this uh, frontier, the broadband frontier, frontier the, soft, the soft power frontier, that China has a lot to play in Latin America and in particular in Brazil. Brazil has been now exporting more than 30% of its uh, balance of exports to China. It's been expanding this fight President Bolsonaro rhetoric against China and uh, misconceptions about global trade. But let's realize also that the Minister of Foreign Affairs was substituted, and the Itamaraty, the Minister of Foreign Relations, has a very well-known and acknowledged tradition of being pragmatic. So a country that exports more than 30 percent of its soy and iron and things like that, commodities to China, 
has no way of being out of a very positive prospect with China. And let's include the digital Silk Road in that picture. So nuts and bolts, there's a lot going on between Brazil, Latin America, and China. Okay, let's go to Michael Schifter. Michael, great to see you again. Uh, how does Washington view this uh, burgeoning relationship between China uh, and uh, Latin America? Because, you know, as we pointed out earlier, um, the United States has always regarded the Western Hemisphere, the entire Western Hemisphere, as falling under its sphere of influence. Right. Well, as has been mentioned already, uh, you know, the conventional thinking a couple of years ago is that China wasn't going to do anything in Latin America that would risk its relationship with the United States. Um, but it sees the United States as increasingly withdrawn from the region, as losing a lot of interest, uh, its attention being diverted elsewhere. And so China has become emboldened and is no longer, I think, concerned about that. And the other aspect that hasn't been mentioned is, is let's look at what's happening internally in the United States. Um, this is where I think the change has been most significant in terms of this uh, deterioration uh, of the political system, dysfunctionality of government, uh, polarization, inequalities. Those kinds of things have taken a, a toll, and they have implications about the capacity of the United States to project a coherent foreign policy overall, and also to be uh, deeply engaged in, uh, in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. So that's been an enormous problem. Now, the United States is look obviously sees with some concern uh, China's expanding uh, presence and influence in the region, especially in the uh, tech sectors, the high-tech sectors. They're concerned about sort of privacy uh, issues. They're trying to um, compete more effectively. Uh, there's the D Development Finance Corporation and uh, the idea of the Build Back Better World. Um, and so there is, there is a, I think, an interest and an intention to be more engaged economically in the region. But I think, frankly, it's not going to be able to uh, match uh, the resources that China has um, and huge infrastructure projects and the like. They just won't be able to, to compete. I do, I do, I would underscore the distinction that was made that, you know, Latin America, China still doesn't have as much economic leverage in Mexico, let's say, as, uh, as, as the United States does there. There's just very deep ties and some 80 percent of Mexico's trade goes to the United States. So, uh, and that's true with Central America and the Caribbean. There's a, there is a distinction between the North America and also South America, where the United States is becoming much, much less uh, engaged and I think influential, and that opens uh, the way for for China and other and other actors as well. Michael, I just want to get back to a point you mentioned earlier, and that is uh, there was a belief that at one time that China would not do anything in Latin America that would endanger its relationship with the United States. But uh, can't it be advantageous to all parties? Well, yes, I think that's you know I, I think that's the way the Lat that's the Latin American perspective uh, is, and I think. The United States, whether it's the Trump administration and now the Biden administration, uh, has to be very careful uh, that it doesn't try to, uh, to, to speak to Latin America by saying you have a choice and you have to pick sides between China and the United States, uh, because that would just be counterproductive. I mean, that's been tried. And the Latin America, because of the dire uh, economic situation in the region, uh, and this was the, remember, this is the region most ravaged by the pandemic. By the way, the United States, that's a classic case where the United States was sleeping while, the, while Latin America was suffering from the pandemic, while the Chinese engaged in mask diplomacy and then vaccine diplomacy, and the United States really lost, a, lost an opportunity to be, to be engaged. But I think the United States is coming to terms with the fact that Latin America is simply not going to choose the United States over China. It can't afford to do that. It's got to deal with both. Um, and uh, and it just has to compete, learn how to compete more effectively and try to be more strategic in its approach to Latin America. It's very difficult, but I think slowly, uh, I think Washington is coming to that, or at least most of Washington is coming to that recognition. Tony, looking at the economic and trade relationship between China and the countries of Latin America, has it to some extent changed into uh, a sort of rivalry between the United States and China, a geopolitical rivalry? 
to some extent. I think uh, China is sort of st trying to stay clear of the United States a little bit. But if anybody doubts that Latin America can very easily become a pawn in this larger geostrategic competition between China and the United States, all we have to do is look at that particular uh, clause within the USMCA that explicitly uh, uh, excludes China, although not by name. It says that if any of the parties to the USMCA wants to conclude an agreement, commercial and investment agreement, I presume, with a non-market economy, it must necessarily consult with the other parties. And that gives Washington, D.C. essentially veto power over any potential free trade agreement that Mexico or Canada, perhaps, might want to conclude with China. So there is clearly some concern in Washington that was put on paper on ink uh, you know in the, in the in ink and paper in the in the agreement that obviously doesn't apply to the rest of Latin America but that just means that Mexico is exceptionally important to the United States the trade between Mexico and the United States is 10 times that of China and Mexico but I think I agree with Michael Schefter. The, the rest of Latin America is pretty much on its own. The United States does not have the political interest, the ability uh, within the country to create a consensus about what to do about Latin America. And it doesn't have the kind of financial capital and willingness to invest any financial capital available in Latin America. And thus, that opens a huge opportunity uh, for China. Now, that doesn't mean that China is completely uh, uh, I guess, altruistic in its engagement of Latin America. China has its own uh, neo-colonial interests, if you will, not different than those of Europe and the United States in their own time. Uh, it needs resources that Latin America has. Somebody mentioned, for example, what Brazil trades with China. That's a lot of uh, commodities. Also, uh, we see that in Argentina. We see that with Chile. Whereas with Mexico, uh, it's mostly uh, parts, auto parts, and other items that go directly into the manufacturing chain. So there's a distinction. I think those decisions are made both by the market, but also strategically, depending on what each country can provide. At the end of the day, I think Mexico is considerably less exposed than other Latin American countries because they depend considerably more on the commodities exports towards China. And we know that that uh, is a boom and bust cycle type of uh, uh, condition, whereas Mexico is, is attached to the United States. And that sort of helps a lot. Michael, what do you make of that? Uh, the relationship uh, is about trade, but we, as was pointed out a moment ago, we see a lot of exports from Latin America going to China. These are primary exports, commodities, and then we see a lot of ex, uh, imp, uh, imports into these Latin American countries, which are manufactured Chinese goods. So where's the potential for the relationship to expand? Well, I think, I think you know, that the, what you just described is essentially the way the, the relationship started. Um, you know, that we had this enormous uh, expansion and growth in Latin America from the early, to, from about 2003 to 2013, it grew, the region grew by five or six percent. Uh, poverty was reduced, inequality was reduced, there was a party in Latin America, and it was largely because of, it, w it was fueled by Chinese demand for, for, uh, for, for commodities in the region. Uh, that changed in, in roughly 2013. I think the China's relationship has evolved and diversified in Latin America, has become more involved in, uh, in investments. And also, I think more interestingly, there's a, a trend towards in, in being engaged at the local level. Uh, we all know that Latin America is politically very complicated and very uncertain, and national-level politics is a problem not only for the United States, but for China and other external actors. But there's a way to kind of to try to uh, invest and become economically involved at the local level, which is a trend that we see in Latin America. So this is, you know, this is a relationship that's rapidly uh, evolving. And I think this sort of the old idea of sort of, you know, the commodity by commodities and you sell manufacturers from China that's imported by Latin America, that exists. But I think it's become it's become much more complex than that or original kind of uh, relationship. Jilton Schwartz, there is often a question that arises when we look at the relationship between China, Latin America, and the United States. And that question is, do the countries of, the, of Latin America, do they have to choose sides? And in some instances, it seems that they are forced. I mean, if you look at the situation right now, Argentina uh, just joined the 
Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. Brazil is not a member of that initiative, but it is involved with a number of projects with China. Um, and you know we've seen many countries that have been pressured by the United States not to do business with China. Uh, we've seen pressure against a company like Huawei, uh, insofar as communications is concerned. So, are the countries of Latin America being forced to take sides? I think that's a reality. It's a fact of reality that uh, taking sides is part of the current uh, situation in global geopolitics. Uh, there is lots of tension. And uh, after a period where terrorism was a major issue, we are now back to nation-state politics and geopolitical issues. So Brazil is part of that. Uh, on the other hand, it's really, I, although I'm Brazilian, I'm sorry to stress so much the country, but the, the huge size of the country and the fact that it has a huge consumer market, especially for the digital infrastructures to be built. Let's remember that Huawei just established another cloud uh, infrastructure here in, in, in Brazil and has also in Chile. So I think that uh, although, of course, commodities are important, there's a growing importance for new technologies. Let's remember that China is also investing in a 2025 uh, agenda for new sectors, new industrial sectors, for you know taking part in, in, in artificial intelligence and uh, also the importance of uh, infrastructure for the internet. Brazil is a huge, it's a huge uh, consumer market for the internet. And uh, I think that, of course, taking sides is part of the current state of geopolitics in the world. But on the other hand, I think that especially Brazil, despite the growing importance of commodities, is becoming a much more diversified partner in terms of uh, sectors uh, to be invested in. And on the other hand, it's important to realize that Latin America, especially in Brazil, is a home to a very important diversity of foreign direct investment. In that sector, China is still lagging behind. Uh, there are new sectors to be invested in. I think that the privatization efforts will continue. Uh, we are all waiting for Bolsonaro to go away because this is an anti-China president. A populist, but let's remember that the state of Sao Paulo, the largest and most important state in Sao Paulo, is a partner with China in the production of vaccines. So it's very, uh, it's a complex situation where you have, a, let's say, a stock of foreign direct investment that comes mostly from the U.S. and Europe, but in terms of trade and new sectors, Brazil and Latin America, I think, offer a tremendous opportunity for a multilateral, a truly multilateral balance of trade, a truly multilateral agenda for a new geopolitics. I'm quite optimistic that uh, we'll be over with this uh, uh, very, uh, let's say, uh, uh, well, this government that is now in power, this guy is uh, losing in the, in the polls, and we expect that uh, there will be a new, a new government, and no more than a year or so from now, that will be again capable of putting Brazil in the global in the global scene as a truly multilateral player without taking sides but taking advantage of the huge territory the infrastructure needs and the advanced science and technology that also takes place in Brazil. Aina Tang, and there is another dynamic at play here. I mean what are your thoughts on the strategic competition that we're seeing playing out uh, in some parts of Latin America. I mean, we take Mexico, for example, despite the heavy pressure from the United States not to do business with China, Mexico has chosen Huawei to build its 5G network. What does that tell us? Well, it tells us Mexico is interested in price. The, they're, they're not willing to pay the extra money that it would take uh, to, to buy other equipment. Um, it's really simple. Uh, everybody is, there's been no proof that anything that Huawei is doing or any of their equipment is leaking anything. To the contrary, you know, last week we were talking, about, um, the news was talking about the fact that the U.S. Is, has an unregulated program which is gathering information on its own citizens. You can only imagine what they're doing in uh, places where they have no fetters and they can do what, exactly what they want. I want to push back a little bit on this kind of stuff about uh, China has the same kind of uh, colonial uh, ambitions that the Euro Europe and America has. That has not been demonstrated. Uh, China has come in with a trade agenda. They have never said to somebody, you have to choose between the U.S. and China. 
you know, say, you know, boycott U.S. goods. That is something that the U.S. is doing. Now, if you look at what is going on uh, between the U.S. and you know, places like Mexico, I'm assuming that we're talking about uh, focusing on this 50 years of, of um, uh, relations between China and you. Uh, and, between China and Mexico. Actually, the relationship goes back almost 500 years. Yep. Um, you know, the U.S. is still concerned about migration, uh, drugs, um, you know, this issue that, uh, you know, Mexico should somehow be uh, assisting the U.S. in maintaining its economic pre um, predominance. Uh, you don't hear a lot about what is, and is necessary for Mexico. And as I said, you know, the latest hot topic is that avocados, which is a huge cash crop uh, for uh, Mexico, has been suspended by the U.S. Uh, simply because uh, somebody said that they received a threat from somebody. Uh, uh, a U.S. administrator said he received a threat. I, I don't know that somebody saying they received a threat on an individual basis uh, should be, uh, you know, a sign that they should uh, shut down a trade for a very, very important um, area. This is going to affect U.S. consumers. It's just the timing is such that it's a reminder, I think, that the U.S. is sending to Mexico that you, you know, we control a lot of your agricultural surplus, I mean, uh, agricultural trade, and you're going to have to knuckle under. So I think it's the U.S. who's imposing. Uh, China has offered uh, fair value. Right. Uh, the reason that Mexico has unbalanced is because they're buying, um, you know, goods from China. Uh, if they could buy them more cheaply for somewhere else at the yeah. same quality, they would. It's not about China. It is simply about co world competition. Mm -hmm. And this is where uh, Mexico needs to kind of step up. They're hoping that right. there will be investment uh, by Chinese companies uh, who are looking to access the North American market. Uh, Michael, I've just got about a minute left, but I want to look at something that was written by the Brazilian political scientist Tiago de Aragao. He wrote that the United States sees Latin America as a source of problems. You know, some of them that uh, Ina Tangan just mentioned, illegal immigration, drugs, human trafficking, and corruption, while China is very... Uh, is far more pragmatic about its relationship uh, with the region. Um, and Argao says that Latin American countries feel more comfortable dealing with China. Do you agree with that assessment? No, I think it's a more complicated picture than that. I agree with the first part of the assessment. Um, I agree that the United States does have a negative, a largely negative agenda, which is unfortunate. And this goes back to my original point about domestic politics. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about migration, you talk about drugs, right. protection. Right. These are all domestic political issues. And so that's a problem. It drives policy. And I think there is a negative agenda. But whether they're more, Latin America is more comfortable dealing with China than with the United States, I'm not sure. I think if you ask most finance ministers in Latin America that if the United States were able to offer their countries as much as China offers their countries, right. it right. might take the United States. But the problem is the United States can't offer mm -hmm. what, the, what the Chinese can offer. So they're pragmatic. I think the Latin okay. Americans are very pragmatic. Okay, and that's where we have to leave it. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.